was Freeze Week in London, which is, I suppose, the week in the London calendar when everyone in the art world is in town. And the contemporary evening auctions are the biggest in London. And this was Sotheby's. It was a huge sale, 60 odd lots. And this Banksy was positioned right at the end, the last lot of the evening. I was bidding for the Banksy, uh, the girl balloon. And it was um, the one that, you know, everyone connects Banksy to. The year before, so I think in 2017, it was rated as the UK's most favorite art piece. For me, um, you know, from a collector's point of view and a dealer's point of view, um, it's the holy grail. The estimate being quite low, that encouraged deep bidding. And there was a lot of energy. It was a big sale. We went up to £650,000, stopped there. Towards the end, I think there was maybe about two or three bidders left. 800 now, thank you. The pressure. Last chance at £850,000. 860. Bastiano, we bid in and selling for £860,000. Thank you very much. When the hammer comes down, that's always very loud because it clearly demarcates the fact that the work is sold. happened in sort of like a split second. The gavel came down, the alarm started beeping. Everyone's attention and everyone turning around and all the mobile phones going up. What's happening is that like, some sort of like a fire alarm, there's someone seal a painting. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a move on here. Sorry for having your attention. It stopped halfway and two technicians were sort of ushered out to take it away. And usually they'd have white gloves on and they didn't, so there was kind of an indication that this wasn't expected. Was this a prank by Banksy? Is this a real Banksy? Was this pure genius, or...? It wasn't that the painting fell out because the frame was broken. It was choreographed. Knowing that Banksy is a great provocateur, immediately the question was, was Banksy in the sale room himself? And it seems that he was, but... Again, I'm proven, so this is what keeps you guessing. Who is he? Where is he? Is he here? Is he, you know? He wasn't in the room, but I... How do you know? I... Well, I don't know, but I saw the person who activated the alarm. He had a briefcase with uh, some mechanical machines in there. There was a man with some sort of, not disguise, but, you know, dark glasses and a hat or a sort of... He was wearing sunglasses, yes, um, and uh, he was wearing a hat, I think. Um... It's, so, it's, it's like a comedy. It's like a, it's like a pastiche, it's like a caricature. Was this a prank? Was this a stunt? Or is this art? It was a major art statement. Is it the price that makes art worthwhile? Or is it because you look at it and think, this is brilliant? The art world is very snobby. To most people, it's impenetrable, and Banksy punches through that wall. It's like a massive fuck you to the art world. It is. Oh, no, sorry, I, I am allowed to say fuck. It's work supported the underdog. We're fighting against neoliberalism and capitalism. created a new way of selling, marketing, talking. He alerted a generation to the ills of society. Banksy, à l'heure actuelle, il fait partie des 10 artistes les plus cotés sur le marché de l'art contemporain. And selling for 8 million 500,000 pounds. Congratulations. 
nobody has been that famous and yet invisible. The NYPD would like to arrest him, but just take a look at how ordinary New Yorkers are responding. Everyone's trying to own a bit of Banksy. Removed from the wall of the place. Banksy, what do we want? Banksy, when do we want it? Now! It's just a Ninety-nine point nine percent of the world's population have no idea who Banksy is or what he looks like. People think the anonymity was a slight smart marketing trick by Banksy, a move of pure genius, and it was. But it wasn't done deliberately. It was more self-preservation than self-promotion. How? Urgently, he was wanted by the police. I don't know, but he was certainly painting on walls, and that's a crime. Originally, anonymity was completely essential for him. On a tous une identité. On a tous un prénom à la naissance. La société est construite comme ça. En fait, refuser de donner son identité, c'est refuser de jouer en fait le jeu de la société. Thanks, you've shown that if you don't want to be anonymous, you can. He is probably in the Kardashian age the only person that doesn't want to be famous. Banksy is almost kind of an unofficial spokesperson for people. I mean, we, we all would like our politicians to speak our language, but they don't, on the whole. Deep down, people feel like he's an everyday person and people can relate to that. He's one of us, you know. Keep the mask as it is, then that's fine. We can project. Aujourd'hui, Banksy, c'est le double de followers sur Instagram que le Louvre. Banksy, il parle pas aux 1% comme les artistes de l'art contemporain. Il vient parler aux 100%. il a déjà très rapidement une sorte de patte. Il y a vraiment un côté très ironique dans ses, dans ses œuvres qui font qu'elles sont immédiatement reconnaissables. Une sorte de sarcasme, d'humour un peu british. Easy, simplistic message that you can get when you're going past on a bus, you're going past on a train, or you're walking down the street. They're bold enough to be seen from the moon. Between the humor, politics, and the simplicity of the message, he managed to capture everybody from small children to grandparents. It's like it sucked in everybody. L'homme qui lance le bouquet de fleurs, il l'avait fait au départ à Jérusalem en 2003. Tout le monde s'est approprié cette image pour protester contre la violence de la guerre. Même si on ne connaît pas le contexte de Jérusalem, l'image fonctionne quand même parce que ça rejoint une révolte adolescente, étudiante d'une jeunesse qui est en colère.
Banks is the voice shouting out, screaming against what was happening in society. There were more and more arrests, stop and search. There were more and more security cameras. You were being monitored. You were being monitored through your phones. You were being monitored on the street. It was him, a single voice, bringing all these other voices together. So welcome along, everyone, to the Bristol Street Art and Graffiti Art guided walking tour, where this morning you will be discovering why Bristol is the street art and graffiti capital of the UK, possibly of Europe too. Plus, there's insights into the life and work of Banksy. Not Bansky, it's Banksy, which is based upon his original artist name, which was Robin Banks, which is far too long. So he's shortened his name down to Banksy, and the artist we've all heard of was born from that very moment. Ah, on ne sait pas si Banksy est vraiment né à Bristol, mais on sait qu'il est de Bristol dans le sens où c'est là que sont apparus ses premiers graphes dans les années 90. Et donc, il a vraiment pris cette ville comme terrain de jeu pour son travail. Le graffiti dans le milieu, c'est vraiment l'essence vandale des choses. C'est-à-dire intervention sans autorisation et en posant ce qu'on appelle son blase. Et donc, il démarre par cette énergie vandale. Le graffiti n'est pas un médium de communication pour la population. Le graffiti, c'est fait pour parler entre soi. Il y a un moment de bascule où il va adopter la technique du pochoir, beaucoup plus mainstream, beaucoup plus populaire pour venir dire des choses au plus grand nombre. Il passe à la capitale, à Londres, et puis euh, là, il touche un public qui est beaucoup plus large, qui est beaucoup plus important, des médias aussi qui sont plus importants. Et là, en arrivant à Londres, il y a vraiment un impact beaucoup plus important sur euh, l'ensemble du pays, en fait. This young guy from Bristol spread his message throughout London. And it was those very early stencils in London that just hadn't been seen before. So it was, it was like a new voice in a bigger city. It started really in 2002. I was sat in my photography gallery and an art dealer who I knew came in and he had a roll, size of this, of Banksy prints. And they were all rude coppers. He peeled one off, put it down on my desk and said, do you want to buy these? It was a picture of a copper holding his finger up like this, called Rude Copper, and I didn't get it. Within two weeks, I realized my mistake, and that suddenly these works were taking off, and kids were going in to these pop-up shows that Banksy were doing, buying these prints, going straight back to their digs, getting on their computer, getting onto eBay, and flipping them for profit, and create this crazy market that took off at such an exponential speed, it was quite shocking to watch. Il est insolent en fait. Il parle à cette jeunesse parce qu'il en, il en est quoi, il en fait partie. And I kicked myself to this day that I wasn't in early enough to understand it because I'd be a lot wealthier now. The trajectory of his career is aligned with that of the internet. Because for the first time ever, suddenly there was a tool that these artists couldn't get 
representation by the galleries and weren't being accepted by the museums. Suddenly their careers flew because they could get their work out. What museum or gallery in the world can bring you that kind of audience? Painting walls isn't enough for Banksy anymore. A graffitied elephant, the star of this American show. Très rapidement, il se dit que le mur ne lui suffit plus et qu'il faut absolument qu'il perce le marché de l'art. A step away from street art, this is Banksy's graffiti rendered into 3D. Banksy says this is a different kind of family day out. Welcome to Dismaland. End joy. Il invente carrément un Disney horrifique. C'est l'inverse de Disneyland. C'est un Disney qui ne repose que sur des images très, très glauques de mourants, de migrants en train de se noyer. Un autre endroit, ça va être les médias qui vont prendre pour leur grade. Un autre endroit, c'est le rêve qui est brisé. Et Banksy va dire, mais vous vous rendez pas compte, en fait, derrière Mickey, derrière le château de la Belle au Bois Dormant, il y a ça, quoi. Ça, c'est la, la réalité. Ce qui fait qu'il sort du lot, c'est son propos cinglant. C'est quelqu'un qui vient appuyer là où ça fait mal, qui mène des combats. Et finalement, est-ce que c'est pas là l'essence d'un artiste He is the most famous artist in any point of art history. You might have Leonardo da Vinci and a couple of others might come close, but in terms of the most recognizable artist today worldwide, this Banksy. Square in office. 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 Aujourd'hui, on peut dire que c'est un artiste qui est là pour toujours. On a le Picasso devant nous du 21e siècle. On a le Andy Warhol. Il n'y a plus de discussion là-dessus. Artist Banksy's moved here for a month and he's promised to surprise the city every day with a new piece of work. His canvases are cars and city walls. His fans and New York detectives alike combing the city in a hunt for the murals. He basically did, you know, a gallery exhibit on the streets of New York and nothing was for sale. That did get the city kind of Banksy crazy. Like a Banksy would appear and everybody would turn up and be taking pictures in front of it. Every morning there was like a new Banksy, which is pretty cool. Et en fait, il joue sur l'adrénaline, il joue sur l'excitation du public qui va se dire chaque matin où est l'œuvre de Banksy. Je veux être le premier à la trouver, je veux être le premier à la relayer, je veux le voir en premier. <rire> On était à l'époque 2013, quelques-uns à le suivre. Mais là où c'est devenu hallucinant, c'est que ben, chaque jour, on était plus nombreux à suivre sur les réseaux sociaux. Banksy has taken the big apple by storm. Je me rappelle qu'au bout de 8-10 jours, ça faisait les JT de toutes les chaînes du monde entier. Banksy está dejando su huella. De grandes fresques réalisées à la faveur de la nuit. On voit vraiment des mouvements de foule, on voit que les gens se passionnent complètement pour ce jeu de piste. Where's Banksy? Where's Banksy? That's the only thing that New York City was talking about. I haven't seen that kind of excitement in the city about something going on. And, and you know, I've lived here my entire life. My wife's cousin called me around 9, 9.30 in the morning and said, 
you know, you have a Banksy. I said, oh shit, really? And he said, yeah. I said, oh, that's pretty cool, let me go see. So I walked over here and I looked and all of a sudden I see we have Banksy. There's hundreds of people, and I see there's news teams starting to show up. So we took my building engineer, and we got a big piece of plexiglass, and we came over here. And then people started yelling and screaming, what are you doing? You're, you're defacing, you know, you're defacing the Banksy. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm the general manager of Zabar's. Zabar's owns this building. We want to protect it. And then we got a standing ovation. <laughs> it was like, Everything changed in a second. I think it's a miracle because he never got caught. And he's, he's been doing it his whole career. He's under the radar. He's, he's like Superman. You just can't catch him. You running up to somebody's property or public property and defacing it is not my definition of art. Graffiti does ruin people's property and is a sign of decay and loss of control. So the mayor may be contemptuous. The NYPD would like to arrest him. Je me rappelle le maire qui lance comme ça une conférence de presse et d'un coup il est pourchassé par la police parce que c'est finalement une insulte aussi à l'ordre établi qu'il est en train de faire, se permettant chaque jour d'investir des nouveaux murs, des murs publics, des murs privés. The New York City Police Department would like to remind you if you see something suspicious in the station. There was a catch me if you can element to it. And it's weird with all the surveillance and everything else. You never saw like surveillance footage of him actually doing his work. Le public recherche Banksy, les autorités recherchent Banksy, la presse recherche Banksy. Il avait tous les paparazzi aux fesses. On... Enfin, C'était pire que la famille royale britannique, quoi. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, il est devenu tellement important que l'anonymat lui-même est une quête pour beaucoup de gens pour le démasquer. I can't even imagine what it must feel like to be Banksy, to wake up every morning knowing that the, the very tenant of your existence, the core of what you are, is at threat every day. Every day you pick up a newspaper, every day you turn a radio or television on, it could be game over. Is la fin du mystère Banksy? Personne n'a jamais su qui c'était. Aujourd'hui, un blogueur dit avoir découvert son identité. As a journalism student, I had to come up with ideas and articles that would attract attention online. Me being stupid, me being young, me being a bit of an idiot, I was like, fuck it. Why don't I go after the biggest story in the world? Not like who killed JFK, but something everybody can connect to, something everybody is interested in, who is Banksy. If anyone is going to find out who Banksy is, why can't it be some guy in his pants on a Sunday in his house, a student, typing up like a hacker? I, I, felt, I felt like I was a hacker. I'm kind of like the overweight guy eating McDonald's, you know? Ooh. This all started on January 28th, 2016. I went to see Massive Attack in Glasgow. The show was amazing, although I was very drunk. But I thought to myself, holy shit, Massive Attack are from Bristol, Banksy's from Bristol. It was a general consensus that they operate in the same world. And I was like, okay, let me see if I can find something.
One of the first places I looked at was Los Angeles, 2006, because that was something that really stood out to me when Banksy went into Disneyland and he left a kind of human crash doll dressed up as a Guantanamo Bay detainee. I was like, OK, here I have a specific more or less date about Banksy. So did Massive Attack play a concert there? Bingo. Massive Attack played two concerts, one in Anaheim and one in California, in Los Angeles. Massive Attack se retrouve en tournée américaine et passe par le Hollywood Bowl, donc on est en septembre 2006. Donc c'est vrai que ça coïncide euh, totalement avec euh, la présence de Banksy euh, à Los Angeles. That for me was a good starting point. And then in 2010, Massive Attack went on concert. They played in San Francisco, they played in Boston. Looked at newspaper reports from these cities, I realized that Banksy had been there almost like one day before or one day after. Okay, man, this is definitely a connection being made here. It makes sense. Massive Attack comes as a one-night gig in New York, and like for the next 30 days, the city is plastered with these crazy Banksy pieces. These kind of like snippets of information and connection just kept on being fed into me. In 2008, Banksy left 14 stencils around New Orleans. But in New Orleans, Massive Attack hadn't played a show. If Massive Attack weren't playing a concert, why was Banksy there? Bang. 2008, Robert Del Naja, the singer's history, went to New Orleans to give the premiere of a documentary film about Hurricane Katrina. Robert Del Naja fait la musique pour un doc qui parle des erreurs qui ont été commises sur la gestion de l'ouragan Katrina à la Nouvelle-Orléans. Et dans le même temps, on voit des œuvres de Banksy apparaître à la Nouvelle-Orléans. Notamment, une des œuvres représente la police en train de piller une boutique. Ces deux artistes, au même moment, vont dénoncer la même chose. Ils ont vraiment des similitudes qui sont assez troublantes. C'est-à-dire que, par exemple, Robert Del Naja n'a pas hésité à diffuser des images en grand écran de migrants pendant un de ses concerts. Banksy s'engage aussi aux côtés des migrants. Robert Del Naja est clairement positionné contre la politique d'Israël, Banksy aussi. Donc, si ce n'est pas les mêmes personnes, en tout cas, ils ont les mêmes engagements politiques. There was the anti-Iraq war when Tony Blair was in power here. It was one of the biggest political rallies of, in history in the UK. And Banksy did a whole set of placards for that called Wrong War. que Robert Del Naja a manifesté contre la guerre en Irak, contre Tony Blair, en 2003. Donc on sent voilà, qu'il y a, à, à différents moments de l'histoire, il y a vraiment des, des causes communes très fortes pour ces deux personnes. J'ai aussi jamais réalisé que Robert Del Naja était partie du mouvement de graffiti. He kind of kick-started the movement, not only in Bristol, but even in the UK. He was one of the real original graffiti artists under his old moniker, Delge, of 3D. Banksy said 3D was a big influence on me. Robert Donaja said, oh, Banksy was a big influence on me. People always assumed that they were friends, but no one suggested they're just talking about themselves. He's just talking about himself to throw people off the chase. The turning point, or the point where I said to myself, I've got him. As if I had like a net, I'm running behind Banksy and I'm like, I caught him, was in Naples. But in August 2004, Banksy left a stencil called Madonna con la Pistola. Robert Del Naja, funny name, Italian name. His dad is from Naples and he is a crazy Napoli football fan. 
And the first time that he attended the stadium was almost the exact same time when Banksy left the stencil there. And that's when I said to myself, you fucking done it, son. You know, I was like, it's him. It is him. Robert Del Naja is Banksy. The world may have finally discovered the secret identity of the renowned guerrilla street artist known as Banksy. A British student named Craig Williams proposed the theory in a blog post back in January that Robert Del Naya of the electronic hip hop trio Massive Attack is behind the international works of art. Before I even finished my journalism course, I'd already done the biggest thing that I will ever do in my life as a journalist. So it's pretty fucked up, but cool by another. Banksy, Robert Del Naja ont les mêmes engagements politiques, mais euh, si je voulais un peu plaisanter, je pourrais dire que j'ai les mêmes aussi et que ça fait pas de moi Banksy, quoi. On peut chercher des points communs. Euh, pour moi, c'est pas forcément des preuves. I don't think that that makes you know Robert and Banksy the same guy. I mean, I, I would love for somebody to go deeper and say when was a Banksy done in a certain city? A massive attack was completely somewhere else. Il y a totalement euh, des incohérences dans la concordance des dates. Le 20 octobre 2014, il y a un pochoir de Banksy qui apparaît qu'il a jeune fille à la perle à Bristol. Et en fait, la veille, Massive Attack était en concert à San Francisco. Donc, euh, il n'aurait pas pu en fait faire le concert la veille à San Francisco et ensuite aller euh, mettre un pochoir dans les rues de Bristol. You would never be able now to know who Banksy is. At least 50 to 60 percent of my time was spent trying to keep him anonymous. How? Oh, all sorts of things. We do fake news stories. I, you know, we were way ahead of Donald Trump on the fake news. Like, you know, part of it was putting out news stories. I put the websites and everything were in my name. You know, lots of things we did that I'm not going to tell you about. My years with Banksy were the best years of my life. We live like kings, but without any rules. I picked out some of my favorites over the years. So uh, this is my favorite portrait that I've done. I think we went from there to the city farm and did something really weird. So this was great. This was in West London. And this is a good example of him like working middle of the day. That's not a quick stencil. That's not a five minutes and done. That's probably an hour of him on the street doing a piece with no one saying shit. There was another time where we set closed off a street with cones with guys with high-vis jackets, pretending that the road was closed so he could do a big piece underneath a bridge. All sorts of various techniques. I've never, ever known him do anything at night. It's like an invisibility cloak. You put on a boiler suit and a high-vis jacket, and you look like you're supposed to be where you are, most people just walk past. Institutions are very careful about making sure no one steals their paintings. However, they never had any interest in people going in there to put up a painting. So he sort of shuffled along dressed in a sort of beard and mac and everything, and put in a painting on walls. And of course, it was Banksy who put it up, but already there was a bit of a team with him. I went with him, so we did a dry run the day before. 
Then we went back the next day to do it for real. So I had a little camcorder, so I was filming us as we went up the steps. I go to get into the tape, the security guard stops me, says, you're not allowed to film. I'm like, shit. <laughs> it's like, if we don't film it, then it's, it's all for nothing. I'll end up flicking the lens cap off the camcorder and filming it all with the camera down by my hip, just hoping that there was some footage, which there was in the end. Everything was kind of planned out with meticulous precision. Nothing was really left to chance. There wasn't many things that happened that weren't, like, thought through and planned. I mean, it's almost part of his kind of modus operandi to choose remote areas. They seem random, but obviously they are. They're quite premeditated. Bonksi, c'est vraiment un génie situationniste. Il vient dire la bonne chose au bon endroit et au bon moment. Ce petit chat dans un décor de ruine après une, une séquence de bombardement il y a plusieurs années à Gaza et tout le monde s'interroge qu'est-ce que fout ce petit chaton et là euh, il nous dit bah le, le, le sujet le plus regardé dans le monde entier sur les réseaux sociaux. Ce sont des chats, des petits chatons. Ben, si je veux que vous vous intéressiez à ce qui se passe là-bas, ben, je suis venu faire un chat pour que vous puissiez mettre votre nez et regarder ce qui se passe là-bas. The work he's done in Palestine drawn so much world attention for the young people who would never have engaged with what Palestine is, what Israel is, are suddenly aware of this. And I think his crusade to make that visible and to highlight the injustice that's happening there, I think is admirable. Banksy has set up the hotel in Bethlehem as a political statement. It's the big attraction to Western holidaymakers. The hotel is very special because uh, it's a hotel with the worst view in the whole world. So it attracts these people, and whilst they're staying there, they get to hear about the exact political situation of the Palestinian people, which isn't normally reflected on the television news particularly well or in a balanced fashion against the other side of the story. On peut faire un coup de génie une fois, mais lui, les coups de génie les enchaînent tout le temps. À Venise, il vient faire cette performance en montrant ces énormes paquebots qui rentrent dans la lagune alors que Venise est en train d'être détruite, est en danger. Il vient réaliser cette œuvre sur la place Saint-Marc. Et une semaine après, les deux paquebots se percutent. Alors l'arbre devient fou, il ne peut pas l'avoir deviné. C'est quand même délirant. Chaque fois, il fait mouche. We had this idea of raising money for a project to provide fresh water for one village in Chiapas. The Zapatistas are an armed social movement who rose up against the Mexican state and against 500 years of oppression. And I think Banksy felt an affinity for the Zapatista cause, as we all did. Banksy painted some murals in those communities. Did his research before he went out there, so he looked at artistic tradition that there is out there. This was the first time he'd gone abroad and done painting abroad and tried to shine a spotlight on a, on a struggle in a different part of the world. Of course, after that, he went to the various other places around the world. C'est 
season's greetings was the only comment from Banksy as he posted this video online, confirming he was behind this gift to the people of Port Talbot. At first glance, the boy is playing in the snow, but the work expands to reveal a burning skip and the ash it emits. It's the kind of political messaging that's often in his work and references the impact of Port Talbot's industrial skyline. Bansi fait une œuvre qui dénonce le dérèglement climatique et donc qui dénonce la pollution des industries qui se trouvent donc à Port Talbot, qui est une région assez polluée. Et en fait, tout le monde s'est dit mais qu'est-ce que c'est que cet endroit C'est quoi Port Talbot Les gens ont commencé à regarder sur une carte, ont commencé à se documenter. Et c'est là où Bansi joue de sa notoriété et en fait finalement une arme qui est très puissante. I imagine that's part of the excitement from his point of view. Is I don't know how much exploration he does, but to find areas knowing there will be publicity and excitement, it almost forces the media then to travel to these places and explore little pockets of the UK. So it's quite a clever concept, really, to actually enforce people to be part of his plan. What did you guys think when you saw it for the first time? Well, I thought perhaps anybody could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Shows I don't know anything about art. But yeah, the more I've looked at it, and I've, I've come to appreciate it now, and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, do, do you think Banksy's here today? Is he? No, well, I'm asking you, do you think he's <laughs> well, here? Well, we don't know, nobody uh, knows. You could be interviewed with him. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of intrigue around that. Yeah. Banksy puts them up on walls in, in places that you think you can't, they're safe. Yeah. And I come along and take them away. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what gives you great pleasure, And it, it gives me, I mean, as I say, I own about 20 originals. And the trouble is that, and a lot of his artwork has got tagged or damaged by other artists. So now it's a case of moving it into town and then it'll be permanently on display where people can just see it all the time. Bullshit. You know, it's, if they, someone walks into a warehouse and finds a Banksy sprayed on a gas canister, fair enough. Yeah, but if you're going around and, like, ripping it off a public wall and taking it out the side of somewhere, you're just making the city a poorer place. It's just a very 21st century, self-centred, narcissistic thing to do. And they should be punished. <laughs> Corporally, death. There we are, we have Banksy going to his new home, but it doesn't matter, because if we turn around by here, we have Banksy on my wall. They're now moving it and putting it inside a building. That's not street art, it's building art. Not the same, it's got no meaning downtown. It was done here to cover the steelworks, it's got a meaning. It should be left out on the street for everybody to enjoy. That's what he's done it for. Banksy doesn't do it to sell them. You know, he proved that with his, pa his painting that he shredded. Um, no, all they want to do is make money from it. And we'll miss him now. Be opening my gate, and what have I got? <laughs> A big hole in the wall. Yes, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. Banksy is so careful about where pieces should be placed, and he doesn't particularly mind if they stay there only for a time, but they shouldn't be taken out of that place for gosh knows how much money. Yeah. 
une œuvre attribuée à l'artiste britannique Banksy volée dans la nuit de samedi à dimanche à Paris. Exclusive vidéo of guys who decided to scale a building, cut down the latest Banksy work and Banksy à l'heure actuelle, il fait partie des 10 artistes les plus cotés sur le marché de l'art contemporain. La moindre œuvre de Banksy est détachée d'un mur et directement quelqu'un va la vendre aux, aux enchères. Alors je pense qu'actuellement ses œuvres sont plus traquées que lui. C'est donc la porte entière qui a été arrachée par les cambrioleurs. Réalisée au pochoir et à la peinture blanche, une œuvre dessinée sur une porte arrière du Bataclan, en hommage aux victimes du 13 novembre 2015, tuées dans la salle de concert par un commando de terroristes. Having a Banksy that's taken off a wall and being sold, I just think is morally and ethically really wrong. For a decade, I was making money out of Banksy Streetworks and I saw absolutely nothing wrong with what I was doing. I recall sitting in my delicatessen down in Kent and I got a call from a colleague saying, have you seen the new Banksy? And I was like, really? Another Banksy? And by this point, I was sort of not famous for it, but I was known, notorious for the guy who goes and takes Banksy's away and upsets everyone. I said, send me a picture. And he sent me a picture of this really ugly mural on the wall. But I saw its potential to make cerebral money. Art Buff is an elderly lady. She's got one of those headsets on that you go to a gallery and somebody's telling you what the artwork means. And in the front there is a plinth and the plinth is empty. My intention was to make as much money as I could possibly could. I had good contacts at Miami Art Fair. I'd been there a number of times. I, I had the credentials necessary. And I agreed that we would try and attempt to remove the piece with a team of guys who can pretty much move anything on the planet. I should have perhaps realized what they were going to do because they come in and start covering the area with scaffolds and chopping the Banksy out of the wall. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning. As the noise echoed across Folkestone, suddenly more and more people started appearing. And it was clear that they were carrying protest placards. They were venomously against what was going on. I felt like we were being robbed. Of, of folks in Banksy, you know, we believed it belonged to our town. You know, we wanted to benefit from it and to see it every day. <laughs> we could be quite smug. We've got a Banksy. Have you got a Banksy? It was a bit like that. I mean, these were relatively middle class, working class, small town folk who suddenly turned into these sort of harridans and monsters screaming abuse at us and my construction guys. I mean, it wasn't just verbal abuse, it was physical abuse. It was just, no, what, why are you taking it? How can it be taken away? And I think the fact that everyone felt it was being taken away for money was even more frustrating. Everybody run up there, they're trying to stop it happening. And then Robin Barton, bank robber, as he's known, the gallerist, he was there walking around winding everybody up and telling them that he had total rights to take it. Because the more upset you are, the more noise there is. The more noise there is, the more media there is, the more media there is, the more value there is. It was a long, long day. I mean, it was 14 hours of drilling and cutting. We finally pulled the last piece of the wall out um, around about sunset, and off it flew out to Miami. By putting it in Miami, the contrast would be so great from where it originally came from, a broken down third world town of Folkestone, and then you've got the glitz and glamour of Miami, and having all the Americans staring at it was quite appealing to me. As you came into Art Miami, there it was, boof, right in the middle, with a price tag of half a million dollars on it. 
There's, of course, a certain irony about selling an artwork for a huge amount of money to a collector about the vacuousness of the collecting of artwork and, and how value is put on art and so on. But no, it was painted to go on that wall. It, it was painted to be in an urban setting. And we'd actively got involved in trying to bring it back. Because it's an illegal act and put out there in the street, covertly, without permissions, there is no copyright issue whatsoever. The person who owns that wall, that door, that window, that floor, is the owner of that artwork. And it gives me the right, on behalf of those freeholders, to sell the works. So it's legal? It's completely legal as long as, and this is the critical mass, as long as the freeholder can prove without question that they are the freeholder. That doesn't tell you who emotionally owns it. It's emotionally owned by the people of the town going, this is Folkestone's Banksy. I'm from Folkestone. It's my Banksy. Whilst I was sunning myself in Miami and drinking I know not what, I got a lawyer's letter saying, we have discovered there is a greater freeholder and that the Godden family were indeed not the freeholders of the building. At this point, it was game over. I was forced to dip my hands in my pocket and pay for it to be returned to Folkestone. It's good that we've got one. It's good that we kept it. No one can touch it now. It's our Banksy, owned by Folkestone. Hands off. So you can see that the whole piece looks amazing, but if you get slightly close up, you can see there's this chop here. The, the, the paint is cracked, and it's where the saw came and just cut this out of the wall. And that's, um, you, you know, the thing about Banksy is the story is as much as the art the artworks. It's never just the painting, it's what happens afterwards, how people talk about it, people demonstrating on the streets, people saying, that's ours and you can't take it. So I don't mind these cuts, because I think people will be able to understand the story better with these little marks that are going through it. Don't mess with folks, and that's the moral of the story, because we love art in this community. Uh, I don't feel guilty about anything I did in Folkestone. And whereas Banksy clearly set his stall up as being the Robin Hood of the art world, I suddenly realised there I was, the Sheriff of Nottingham. I was the bad guy, he was the good guy. Now, I watch movies, who do I want to be? The bad guy. Banksy, I suppose, is up here just looking down at this little thing he made. It's just a massive old circus. Society has embraced him to such a point where he has become part of the establishment. Possibly something he'd kick against if he could, but I'm not sure that creating a prank at Sotheby's with a girl with balloon is a good way of distancing yourself from all the things that he dislikes. A stunt like no other. The iconic image known as girl with a balloon self-destructs. A Banksy painting sells at auction for $1.4 million. I'm frustrated that it didn't shred completely because I think a wholly shredded picture with just bits and pieces lying on the floor is not worth much money. I mean, if the buyer had got these bits and pieces, what's she supposed to do? Stick them together? It wasn't a destructive process. It was a change. And of course, in the end, he gave the painting a new name and a new date, and now it's a different work. So you criticize the market, but you give it what it wants at the same time. So yes, I think I found that was a bit, bit lame, really. Depuis Sotheby's, il y a un retournement de la perception du grand public à son égard. 
Parce que, oui, il est génial, oui, il vient dire des choses, mais ça s'attire du marché qui le propulse chaque fois dans une cote et dans une spéculation, elle commence à interroger. Le doute s'immisce sur sa sincérité. After the event, we had probably around 50 to 60 inquiries on uh, Banksy Girl with balloon print. Um, so yes, um, the demand went sky high, um, especially with Girl with balloon. Um, does it make money from that? Um, indirectly, I'm sure he does. How? Um, I can't say. You can't. No, because I, I, I'm very good friends with my collectors and they can't see me saying that. Okay. Sorry. He's become a capitalist, like, <laughs> like his good friend Robin Barton. <laughs> There was so much money being made by Banksy and by his entourage and by his colleagues, friends, that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that you become the very person that you didn't like when you started out. You become the person sitting in an ivory tower. Can you have a relevant voice when you're so removed from the very thing you started talking about? He still has an agent, he has a manager. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of people working really hard to protect him. Banksy is not the guy who with a spray can anymore. He's a lot bigger than that. Banksy is so famous now, and he keeps putting himself in situations and in doing really big things that we deserve to know who he is. And I think the journalists who one day will reveal him will be will go down in history books for being the guy or the girl who revealed who Banksy was. My source um, decided that he wanted to stay anonymous. He's a forensic expert, due diligence, looks through companies and the owners of companies to see the trails there. I'd like to remain anonymous because I just don't want any kind of exposure. It's just an itch I needed a scratch, and I was just intrigued by the whole thing. I don't need any kind of hate mail for exposing Banksy because there would probably be a bunch of people who were very angry if it turned out I was right. Banksy has just released a documentary exit through the gift shop and it got a bit of noise at that time and then it got nominated for an Academy Award and he still was trying to claim that he was some sort of anonymity, which is impossible if you're making any film like that. As soon as business is involved, and you want to make some money out of that, you have to register companies and the money has to go somewhere. And then there is a paper trail. So I looked up what the production company was. It was a company called Paranoid Pictures. And if you look through this company document on the annual return, you'll find that it's actually owned by another company called Pest Control Office Limited. This is a company that is solely there to verify Banksy works of art to make sure that they're not fakes and they're really actually being made by Banksy itself. So this company is the owner of Paranoid Pictures. But if you look through the annual return here, this in itself is owned by a company called Pictures on Walls Limited. So if you go to Pictures on Walls Limited, looking through this annual return, at the time of my investigation, you can see that the sole owner is Jamie Hewlett. Jamie Hewlett, the founder of Gorillas. It makes sense. Gorillas, Banksy, he's in their music video. He is, yeah, 
I just thought this is him. Gorillas is a fake band. They're not actually humans. They're meant to be these characters, which is very close to what Banksy's doing as well. The other guy in Gorillas, Damien Auburn, has another band called Blur, and Banksy made the front cover for their album. This Blur album cover was designed by Banksy himself. If you look at this still here from one of the Gorillaz music videos, that is a Banksy in the actual music video itself. It was surprising to see that everything just kind of added up. Another thing I may be clutching the straws here, but a few years ago when um, Banksy opened up his hotel, some tourist hosted video footage of who he or she believed may have been a Banksy spotting. And this person that they uncovered doing these graffiti stencils around the corner from the hotel actually looks like Jamie Hewlett from certain kind of facial similarities. Wow. I'm going to reveal who Banksy is. It was too good. The information was too good not to publish. Since I made a bit of a noise, the very next annual return in 2017, if you look here, Jamie Hewlett has transferred all his shares to someone called Marcus Samuel Chambers. So if I was suspicious, which of course I am, there has been a reaction to my action. It's not very kind of fun idea, like using AI to see where people are based in the world at any one point, but this is pretty black and white theory, which you can't deny. Joanna Brooks emailed me, she's Banksy's publicist, saying Jamie Hewlett is not Banksy. But she made a, a mistake, and she spelt Hewlett with an I, not an E. Which is wrong. So I thought, is this a sneaky way of not lying? So if we do reveal him now, and we said, but you lied, she will say no, because I didn't spell it the right way. If it's not Jamie Hewlett, I don't think I believe the other theories more. I went through every single story that had been written on Banksy to get clues where he had been, who his friends were. There was one picture that supposedly was Banksy in Jamaica, and it had been published in the Evening Standard, and then it sort of mysteriously disappeared, and nobody knew who owned the copyright anymore. It was part of the mystery around Banksy. Finally, I found someone who knew who he was, someone that had had interviewed Banksy, that knew Banksy, that knew who Banksy was, and told me that he was called Robin Gunningham. First of all, I found out everything about Robin Gunningham I could. His birth certificate, his parents' names. I did his full family tree with his sisters and cousins and relatives. And then I looked on the electoral roll and all the places he'd lived seemed to be places where Banksy had lived. So I was fairly confident when I went down to Bristol with a team of people that I worked very well with to prove it. And I wanted to do it quickly because I didn't want another journalist to get the story. We spoke to someone called Luke Egan, who denied knowing Robin Gunningham, but he'd lived with him. 
we spoke to a woman who had moved into a flat after Robin Gunningham had left, and she had discovered some old discarded Banksy drawings. I think the final piece in the jigsaw was the fact that one of the neighbors of where Robin grew up identified that initial photograph from Jamaica as Robin Gunningham. And I interviewed someone who went to school with him and he had a photograph of him at school and it looked similar to the picture that was taken in Jamaica. And when I spoke to Mr. Gunningham, he was laughing and smiling and saying, I can't comment. And I said, well, look, if your son is a teacher in Birmingham, you must tell me because I'm going to put in the paper on Sunday that he's Banksy. And he just said, I can't possibly say anything. Nobody apart from Banksy's father would have played games with me the way he did. If you are familiar with the artist known as Banksy, he's never publicly shown his face. Now, though, Banksy may have actually been unmasked. Alors, qui est ce Banksy? Banksy s'appellerait Robin Gunningham, un natif de Bristol. The article claims Robin Gunningham, who's now 35, was great at art at school. Banksy had a background that was posh and privileged, if this article is to be believed. He went to school here, the Bristol Cathedral School. It's hardly the background of someone who's made his name from being hip and street. Geographic profiling is a criminal investigative methodology. It was designed to help prioritize suspects and manage information in a large-scale serial crime case. So if we have a serial murder, there's a pattern to where they hunt and the locations where the offender is most likely based. I was a member of the Vancouver Police Department, and because I had a background in mathematics, I wondered about what you might be able to extract in terms of information from a pattern of crime locations. What I'm showing right now is the top 5% of the area for the art that Banksy did while he was in New York City. I was able to find information on 31 of his uh, graffiti artworks. So I put it into the Rigel system, which I have open here. And you can see here uh, Manhattan. And the dark orange shows the most probable area for Banksy's base. This could be where he was staying in a hotel or if he was uh, crashing at a, a friend's apartment or condo between Union Square Park, Washington Square Park, and it's um, roughly northern Greenwich Village. Well, it doesn't tell us anything about Gunningham or about other suspects, but it would be um, if, you were, if he was still in New York where you would probably want to focus your search efforts for him. Now, if no one tried to find out who Banksy was, well, it would all be rather boring, wouldn't it? This map here shows you through the red dots locations associated with uh, Banksy's artwork, blue dots locations associated with Robin Gunningham, such as where did he live, where did he go to school, where, where did he work, um, anything that you could associate with them. Um, if we had multiple Banksy suspects, we could see which ones came out best, but we don't. So the idea is you look at this and you see, well, that compared quite well. So that elevated the probability um, of him being the correct suspect um, to a certain degree. We're not proving anything here. Um, all we're doing is saying, here's some evidence that either supports the Gunningham theory or um, doesn't support it. In the end, it, it supported it quite well. Yeah, this is a science used to find criminals. Instead, used to catch an artist, the person behind this, Banksy. And scientists say they're 90% sure they have their man. The spatial evidence of the artworks supports the theory that he is the suspect, that he is Banksy. Mystery solved? Don't bank on it. Robin Gunningham, this public school boy, I don't think that this person ever existed. 
I have a feeling that's another one of our fake news things, maybe. Maybe it's not. <rire> Il y a des spéculations très très régulièrement sur son identité qui sont là probablement pour brouiller les pistes. Je ne pense pas qu'il soit complètement étranger à ça. Everyone likes to have another theory about Banksy. There's nothing saying we can guarantee this is a man. The weird thing is, like, the Banksy pieces, anybody could do it. If Banksy gave me the stencil and I bought some spray paint, I could go out and do it. Banksy might have operatives all over the world. Maybe he's got, like, sleeper cells in every city. Il se cache sûrement quelque part là-dedans. Peut-être qu'il n'y a même pas un Banksy. Peut-être qu'en fait, le mastermind, c'est, je sais pas, 10, 15 personnes, 20 personnes. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes um, regarding Banksy. Who is he? Actually, I don't really care. Not that bothered. So if I'm not giving the game away, it would be like telling a small child that Santa Claus didn't exist. And plus, I think the general public made him. Like, they made this folk hero, yeah? And the last thing they want is for someone to blow that myth. It has been a very curious experience because there seems to be a sort of conspiracy to suggest that I'm wrong. People are like, you're a fucking idiot. You've ruined Banksy for me because now I know what he looks like. My retort to them is like, do you know fucking Picasso? Yes. Do you like Picasso? Yes. Do you know what fucking Picasso looks like? Yes. What fucking difference does it make? I think the fact people are upset about it is because there's like a strong political message. They don't want to see the face that tells them it. They want to just be told it by uh, someone they don't know. Everybody wins with him not being known. Would Banksy have the same impact if we knew his name? Well, probably not. It's just like Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is one of the most infamous serial killers in history. Maybe people call him the first serial killer, but that's not true, not by a long shot. But he is perhaps the most famous, and one of the reasons he's the most famous is he's, he was never caught. I suppose at those kind of low times, people reach for the fictional world and the fantasy and they like to feel that there's some kind of rescue just around the corner, and there's hope somehow. Even now that he has a huge possibility of generating money, he stayed very true to the roots that he would have grown up around in Bristol, which is a large community of people who are helping each other in a social and cultural way. And the fact that he is now finding ways to benefit hundreds of people from this incredible achievement that he's made, I think is just a fantastic story. The renowned and elusive artist Banksy is weighing in to help a cash-strapped boys club in Bristol. This youth club was another way where he said, right, I'm going to help them. It was uh, Sunday, April the 13th. Um, it was around one o'clock in the afternoon, and I parked just outside the boys' club gates, and I noticed immediately in the doorway this rather amazing stencil. As I was sat there waiting, I couldn't really take my eyes off it, and I, and I said to my wife, I'm like, that looks like a Banksy. My son came past. He rang me, he said, Dad, you're not going to believe this. I think we've got a Banksy outside the club. I said, oh, don't be so stupid. Don't be so foolish. I wasn't 100% sure. I said, if it's what I think it is, then you need to get that protected, you know? And when I came in, got there, I thought, well, it looks good. It might be a Banksy, but I mean, I don't know much about Banksies. But all I could see was this young couple. They both had their mobile phones. They were both, in effect, supposed to be looking into each other's loving eyes, and in fact, they weren't. They were looking at each other's phones. It 
it really was quite a poignant statement about young people today that the mobile phone can be a little bit more important than the human being. Somebody about to done it, so I thought I'd go and check my CCTV. A white van pull up and park just by what would be the place where the mobile lovers was put. Two men got out of the van. I couldn't see their faces. They had high-vis jackets on and they had helmets on. They just looked like any work team. A gentleman took a picture, drove off, and then at 12 o'clock on the 15th is when it became known to the public and the world, basically, that there was a new Banksy for people to see. And that's when my story began. In April, a picture appeared here overnight, created by the secretive street artist Banksy. For the steady stream of visitors coming to see the latest Banksy creation... There had been a period of time where no new Banksy artworks had appeared in Bristol for a while, and so I was very keen to see the new artwork. I actually thought a murder had been committed outside because I'd never seen so many people with cameras taking pictures of mobile lovers. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, whoa, you know, this really is a Banksy. And we've left it there for two or three days. I mean, <laughs> are we mad? Change back the other way. Don't forget your arms, keep them moving. Come on, you can. Well done, keep going. As soon as he realised it was a Banksy, he knew that he was sat on something that could save the club. So you're going to take it out nice and slowly. The problem with the clubs were that government at the time and local council were cutting funding to youth projects. Boxing really is a fantastic sport. It's something that is always done in a boxing club. OK? We use sport as a platform to engage young people, to give them something to hang their coat on. This is their place to just grow, nurture and develop at their pace, doing what they would like to do where they know they'll be looked after. So I thought, do you know what? I need to take the mobile lovers off the wall and we're going to sell it so that we can save the club. <laughs> And then we had all of the negative press and people writing on the Facebook page, what kind of example are you setting for others? You should be ashamed. People have taken to Twitter as soon as they heard this news today. Some people are calling Dennis Stinchcombe a vulture. I guess that street art, they do it in the streets so that people have more access to it. So it's like a bit of a shame. It's gone already before anyone's got a chance to look at it. So it's wrong. I started getting uh, death threats. What gave me that right black? And it went on and on and on. And this is against a man that's all he's ever done for 30 years is give to the people of Bristol. And you've got people saying, oh, he should be killed. And, and that was the hard thing for me. And finally, oh, the most yes. important thing that happened with all the months of arguments and discussions and dialogues and everything else was the day that this letter came through the door. I got a phone call from Dad, and he's like, Sean, you're never going to believe it. I've only got a letter from Banksy. It was like, wow, this is it, or it's not it. It could be ours, it might not. And it's almost like I wanted to read it, but I didn't want to read it. But there it is now in front of me, and it's like, oh, my God. Private and confidential. Dear Dennis, I hope this finds you well. As you know, I recently painted on a doorway near the club. This was meant to be a small visual gift for the area, but... Apparently, a financial one would have been much more useful. I don't normally admit to committing criminal damage, but seeing as it looks like charges won't be brought anytime soon, you have my blessing to do what you feel is right with this piece. I'm a great admirer of the work done at the club and would be chuffed if this can help in some way. Your tenacity in the past few weeks has made for an entertaining spectator sport. I assume you're familiar with the quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln, things may come to those who wait, but only the things left behind by those who hustle. Best wishes, Banksy, and of course, he signed it at the bottom. This letter was incredibly important, and on that day, I read it, wow, it was like... I 
was so happy for him because no one deserves to be ridiculed on social media because of a picture, because he's seen an opportunity to save a club that he loves with every part of his body. He, he will never be away from that place. That's where his soul's gonna be, that's where his heart is now, and that's where his heart and soul's gonna die. This piece of graffiti sprayed on a boarded up doorway is now officially worth 403,000 pounds. The money itself won't just benefit one club here in Bristol, it will benefit up to six, seven or eight of them. It will go far and wide and it will touch an awful lot of people. It is a very good news story in this city. This was the most direct way that he had used the value of his art for a social purpose. I think we'd lose some of the magic if somebody reveals who he is. exactly who he is because he was a member of my club when he was a lad and I'm not telling you that. Why? <laughs> I can't. Everybody I meet goes, I know somebody who knows Banksy. And then there's a few people who go, I know Banksy, but they can't tell you, really. I mean, you know, so. Donald Trump would love it, right? He's always talking about leakers. Banksy has no leakers. How does he do that? The White House is loaded with leakers. Banksy, no leakers. Even if he wanted to come out and become Banksy, no one's going to believe it. 